Hello and welcome to study this. We're going to go over chapter 3 of Guyton and Hall's medical physiology textbook which covers the control of protein synthesis and also cell reproduction. It's a pretty long chapter but we'll try to get through the main points here for you and they can really be divided up into two main categories of looking at how DNA works within a cell to create a protein and then it talks about a little bit later how, how a cell divides into two separate cells that contains the same amount of chromosomes. But first, a few definitions. So DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid, whereas RNA, just take out the deoxy, is ribonucleic acid. These molecules help to control and form specific proteins. So a cell is going to do a particular function by producing certain proteins, which allows it to have that function. And in order for it to have that protein, the DNA needs to be read, and then that DNA will correspond to a particular protein. This entire first half of this chapter can be really well summarized with this figure 3-1, where we have a nucleus of a cell, and within this nucleus we have our DNA. The DNA, which remains within the nucleus, needs to somehow get its signal out into the cytoplasm, which has all of the molecules and the structures there to make a protein. So in order for it to get its signal out into the cytoplasm, it creates an RNA which is effectively just a messenger service or a, a copy of a segment of the DNA, which is saying you need to produce this particular type of protein. The RNA then gets processed, comes out of the nucleus. The RNA, which represents a segment of this DNA, gets read by ribosomes and some other RNA that will go over. And that reading of that messenger RNA or the mRNA will form a protein. That protein will be some kind of structural element, maybe an enzyme, which will then allow the cell to have a particular function. So in order for a cell to work, it needs to activate certain segments of the DNA to then create certain proteins to then do its function. Nice and simple. So let's get down to the building blocks of DNA. DNA is really made out of these three main substances, so phosphoric acid, deoxyribose sugar, and then four nitrogenous bases. The first two components, the phosphoric acid and the deoxyribose, forms the backbone. The nitrogenous bases forms the code which corresponds to a particular protein that needs to be produced. RNA is different where you just have a ribose sugar and one of the nitrogenous bases are switched, which we'll talk about as well. So these are the four bases here. You're unlikely to need to know the actual structural elements of each base, but it's important to know what each one is. Adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. So Adenine always attaches to a thymine, and a guanine always attaches to a cytosine, and vice versa. So A to T, G to C. They are separated into two separate categories based on their molecular structure. So the pyrimidines form the thymine and the cytosine, whereas the purines are adenine and guanine. We then have, obviously, our deoxyribose and our phosphoric acid as well, which forms the backbone. Now, what do I mean by the A to T, G to C? Well, we have two strands within our DNA, so two backbones which are wound around each other, and the codes or the bases are facing each other and are connected by loose hydrogen bonds. That connection is going to be between those pairings that I talked about. So A to T or T to A, and then C to G or G to C. So whenever you have an A on one side, you know that on the complement DNA, you're going to have a T. That's actually how they figured out what the genetic code is. And the genetic code is effectively just this line of C, G, T, G, C, A, T, C, T. Because all this is saying is which amino acid needs to be produced within a particular protein. This genetic code here was able to be found because they could just figure out uh, a G fits in this spot, that means that uh, the other side must be a C and so on. So once you know what one side is, you know what the complement is, um, or at least you should. Sometimes there's mutations which allows another base pairing to get in there, which is erroneous. Um, but in a normal situation, you're going to have A to T, C to G. Three of these bases forms a triplet, and those three bases will correspond to an amino acid, which needs to be in line for production within a protein for that segment of DNA. So everything's counted in threes. So three bases within the DNA is going to be a triplet. And then the succession of triplets is our genetic code telling us which amino acids need to go in which order. So next we're gonna talk about transcription, which is how the DNA gets transcribed or read to produce an RNA segment for that one area of DNA. Remember, DNA is huge. So you just want to read that one little segment of DNA which corresponds to one particular protein. You want to read it and produce a messenger RNA which corresponds to that segment of DNA, which can then go out into your cytoplasm to turn into a protein. 
something which it mentions here in this book within this chapter, uh, which we'll just cover now because I think it's so important, is that every single cell that you have has the entire genetic code. So each cell can technically be any other cell, but portions of it have been suppressed in order to only allow certain segments of the DNA to be read so then it can do that particular function. So that's why we need to create a very tiny messenger RNA for just a segment of DNA for that cell to produce a particular protein. The initial reading is called transcription, and transcription is effectively just an RNA polymerase coming along, activating the nucleotides that are needed to create the RNA molecule. It then will unwind the DNA at a certain segment determined by where the promoter region is. A promoter is effectively just an area which indicates the start of where transcription should take place or the start of a particular genetic code for a particular protein. So RNA polymerase is going to activate all these nucleotides, go to the DNA, unwind it at the promoter region, then start to read that DNA segment going along, reading all the triplets and creating the corresponding RNA nucleotides or RNA strand. The one difference with this RNA strand, it's going to be complementary to that DNA strand, but all thiamines are going to be replaced for a nucleotide called uracil. That's what makes RNA different to DNA, other than having just a ribose sugar instead of deoxyribose. All thiamines are replaced for uracils. So whenever you see a U, you just think that's a T, so you know that corresponds to an A. So this RNA polymerase has just been going along, reading this DNA strand. This G got read as a C, G read as a C, C read as a G, A read as a U, etc. So it is creating this RNA molecule that is complementary to that particular DNA strand. It will then hit a chain terminating sequence, which is saying this is the end of this particular segment of genetic code that corresponds to a particular protein. And then you'll have a bunch of codons here, which correspond to particular amino acids. Codons are complementary to the triplets on the DNA strand and correspond to a particular amino acid. In this example, it's CCG corresponds to proline. UCU corresponds to serine. And you can see what every single RNA codon, which codon corresponds to which amino acid, because when you only have four different nucleotides, A, G, C, and T for DNA, or U for RNA, then you can only have a certain number of combinations, and they will all correspond to a particular amino acid. Remember, remember that there's only 20 amino acids, so every single amino acid is represented here, including all the RNA codons that are possible. So if you can read a particular DNA strand, you can tell exactly which amino acid it's trying to, say, uh, needs to be produced in which order. You then have the start chain initiating sequence. So this is the, the initiation of the start of the polypeptide or the protein chain, that's AUG. And then the stop chain terminating segment is going to either be UAA, UAG, or UGA. It's pretty unlikely you need to know every single one of these codons. Often it's just helpful to remember the start and the stop codons. So that is effectively transcription. You create a messenger RNA, which is also known as an mRNA, which corresponds to a segment of DNA, and it contains a bunch of codons which correspond to an amino acid. We'll talk about how that amino acid actually gets read and turned into a protein in a second when we talk about translation. However, there's a segment here which talks about all the different types of RNA molecules. We have the precursor messenger RNA. This is that raw RNA that gets produced right off the DNA strand. It contains both introns, which are non-coding regions, and exons, which are coding regions, effectively saying that there's empty pages on this sheet of uh, messenger RNA that need to be taken out. So there's a process called splicing, which takes out all of those introns, which do not represent a code to anything. Um, once all of those introns have been taken out, you're just left with all the exons effectively and your final mature uh, messenger RNA. We also have small nuclear RNA, which helps direct the splicing process, this process of removing the introns. Messenger RNA we've talked about, which carries that genetic code from the nucleus into the cytoplasm where all the amino acids are. We have transfer RNA, tRNA. This is another very important RNA that we'll see in, during translation. This is the RNA which reads the messenger RNA um, and is able to bring the amino acids to the protein molecule that's getting created. So we'll talk about transfer RNA uh, just after this. And then ribosomal RNA, which is the RNA uh, which is contained within ribosomes. Ribosomes is a scaffolding structure where the proteins are getting created. We'll also talk about that in translation. And then micro RNAs. Micro RNAs are non-coding RNAs that do not create a protein. Rather, they regulate gene transcription and translation. They're little 
regions of RNA that almost just go and get in the way of transcription and translation by um, just kind of plugging a hole um, and then preventing the RNA being transcribed or being translated to down-regulate gene transcription and translation. It's just a way to uh, regulate our genetic control here, which we'll also talk about a little bit later on as well. So effectively, we have translation next, which involves transfer RNA and ribosomal RNA. Transfer RNA or tRNA contains this funny, weird clover leaf like structure down the bottom here, which is reading the messenger RNA, which is represented in blue here, supported by a ribosome. Now, this clover leaf structure is just a long RNA that's all coiled up, um, and this one region here has three nucleotides or bases which represent an anticodon because that will correspond to a particular codon on the messenger RNA. So this transfer RNA has the anticodon of GGG. So whenever an mRNA molecule is being read and a CCC codon appears as the next codon to be read, so we now need this particular amino acid to be formed. The tRNA that has GGG as uh, shown here will be able to come along and connect to that codon with its anticodon and bring with it its amino acid, the proline, to then attach to the growing protein molecule. So each tRNA molecule contains one amino acid attached to it and an anticodon, and it just brings the amino acid to the growing polypeptide chain once its codon is up and ready to be read. And as you can see over here, one mRNA molecule can be read by multiple ribosomes or multiple tRNAs. So you can form multiple proteins at the same time. So this one mRNA has multiple ribosomes attached to it and multiple protein molecules are all getting produced. Whenever this is seen, it's called a polyribosome. It's got a little segment here talking about a nucleolus. A nucleolus is effectively just a region within the nucleus that you can see sometimes on a microscope. And it's a little kind of dark purple spot. And it's just all the ribosomes getting formed and some RNA molecules getting formed. It's really just showing this really dense area of uh, RNA. Um, it's getting produced because that cell is likely producing a lot of proteins. So the highly productive cells often have a nucleolus. We've talked about these microRNAs, small interfering RNAs are, are very similar, where they just prevent translation, but they can also degradate messenger RNA as well before it's translated. So just trying to tone down um, our process here, because maybe you've produced a bunch of messenger RNA to produce a pro bunch of proteins, and then suddenly you're producing too much, it's just gonna able to uh, kind of tone that down. So it's a regulatory RNA. So this is the segment here that actually talks about translation. We talked about it all just using figure three nine here. And translation is able to also occur on the endoplasmic reticulum or the rough ER because that's where all the ribosomes are um, or there is a concentration of them on the endoplasmic reticulum. And then our polypeptide chains can get produced into the endoplasmic reticulum for further processing. So here's the chemical steps in our protein synthesis. Each amino acid is first of all activated with ATB. It combines to its specific tRNA, which has the anticodon that corresponds to that amino acid. And then once the messenger RNA requires that an amino acid, the codon will be read by the appropriate anticodon and bring that amino acid along to be joined to the polypeptide protein chain. That amino acid getting attached to the polypeptide chain occurs by peptidyl transferase, one of these amino acids that creates the peptide bond. There's then a little segment here about regulation of our cellular activity. Um, before we get into mitosis and the creation of two cells. Effectively, we need to have regulatory controls within our cells so things don't get spiraling out of control. And it's done by two methods, genetic regulation using some of these methods we've already talked about and we'll elaborate on a little bit here, and then also enzyme regulation, which is often the kind of end product of um, reading the genetic code, is creating enzymes to do certain biochemical reactions. So genetic regulation, um, we can kind of summarize this in figure 313 here where we've got several regions which is able to control or regulate the reading of the DNA code. We have the basal promoter, which controls gene expression right at the start, um, and this is called the TATA box or the T-A-T-A-A-A -A 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 region. This can be regulated by some transcription factors that can bind to it um, and kind of help to control the reading of that certain segment. We then have an upstream promoter and then also enhances, so they may increase the transcription of this genetic code um, as long as it has the favorable transcription factors attached to it. 
And then we have our insulator. This insulator is exactly what it sounds like. It insulates certain regions from each other because you're going to have segments of the DNA code which are very active in a particular cell to form a very particular protein. But perhaps right next to that DNA code is another region which would create a completely different protein that's not needed by the cell or could be harmful. But you do not want to read that region. But you've got this highly active region right next to it. So the insulator just helps to kind of separate those two segments and make sure that you just read the, the DNA region that you would like. So that is genetic regulation. But we also have enzyme regulation, and I feel like we've already touched on this in chapter one. Effectively, the enzymes can be regulated either by producing a substance which then directly stops the enzyme, so that's negative feedback because production of the produce stops the production of that produce itself. And also another form of enzyme regulation is the fact that most enzymes are actually inactive and they require activation to start working, usually because of depletion of a certain substance, which then activates the enzyme to uh, produce what you need to. Now we move into the life cycle of the cell. And this is kind of the second half of this chapter, all summarized here in this one figure, uh, but effectively going over how one cell can turn into two that contains the exact same genetic code. The majority of the time, each cell sits in a phase called interphase for about 95% of its lifespan. That's just the non uh, reproductive stage of a cell's life. Um, you know, it's doing its normal protein production or its normal function that it's, it's there to do. Um, and then 5% of the time, it's going to go through mitosis, which is the creation of two daughter cells that contain the same genetic code. Immediately before mitosis, in order for you to have two genetic codes or two completely identical segments of DNA, you, you need to replicate the DNA before you go through the process of splitting into two cells. So immediately before mitosis, the hours before, you go through DNA replication. Very similar to how RNA is transcribed, but instead you're doing the entire genetic code, the entire DNA segment. Um, so effectively what happens there, before we get into the phases of mitosis, so we may come back to this uh, figure, um, we'll go over DNA replication, which is summarized in figure 313 here. Uh, effectively, you've got several enzymes which help to break apart the DNA, read the DNA, and create two separate segments. So over here, we've got helicase, which creates a replication fork, effectively just breaking the two strands apart. We then allow DNA polymerase to read the DNA strand and create a complementary strand. Importantly, it's going to go and attach to an RNA primer, which is effectively just the starting point, it's saying you need to start here and read on from here. Um, and it's always going to read in what's called the five prime to three prime direction. So reading from five to three, or creating a strand from five to three, uh, but uh, that means it's the opposite in terms of um, the, the strand that's being read is being read from the three prime direction. Um, so it's a little confusing just trying to remember all these threes and fives, but effectively DNA polymerase creates the complementary strand from five to three. And in the leading strand, um, you get a continuous creation of a complementary DNA strand because you just follow the replication fork. This is getting forked open and this just follows along. The problem with the other strand down the bottom here is that this has the five prime uh, side of it, which remember our DNA polymerase needs to create from the five to the three. So if this is already the five direction, that means we have to start further back, create the five prime side of the DNA strand for the complementary strand, and then move in this direction to create your strand moving towards the three prime. So you create these segments because you have to wait until, until your primer sets in, create a fragment here, and then wait for the helicase to unwind further, and you've now exposed a greater portion of your DNA um, strand, and then you can go over here and do the same thing and create another fragment. So you're just constantly bouncing forward and creating backwards, bouncing forward, creating backwards, and creating these fragments called Okazaki fragments. Those Okazaki fragments are then glued together by DNA ligase, which is also going along and attaching all the nucleotides together. And then you've also got your copoisomerase. This enzyme here goes further up um, 
head of the replication fork because as you could imagine if you've got something that's wound around on itself and then you start to actually break it apart so imagine two strings wound around each other and then you take the other end and you just pull on it you're going to overwind the front half of the rope or in this case the dna this enzyme just comes along and temporarily cuts it lets it unwind the dna strand that is and then reattaches that just prevents that overwinding of the dna just a, a funny little feature that nature's created uh, just to prevent that overwinding of the DNA as it gets um, separated. The DNA is then read by both exonucleases, but then also our DNA ligase and DNA polymerases as well. So you're proofreading your DNA to check for any mutations where, you know, for instance, maybe a, a G is attached to an A, uh, just as a, a random example. Most of those just don't do anything, but you want to go and clean it up, take it out, put in uh, what needs to be there. If they're left, uh, that is what a mutation is. The majority of mutations just do nothing because a large portion of our DNA is non-coding, meaning it doesn't produce proteins. So most mutations actually do nothing. Uh, but worst case scenario, that mutation literally just means that one amino acid is now switched for a completely different one and that could be catastrophic for the protein that is produced um, and then whatever protein that is could cause disease in the cell or in the person. That's why mutations can be bad in, in DNA and that's why we have this proofreading system to try to get rid of mutations but the occasional mutation does get through, the majority of which are not a problem uh, but some lead to disease and, and effectively cancers. Now before moving on here, DNA replication is semi-conservative meaning that half of the new DNA is the original DNA, and then the other half is a brand new strand. At the end of the day, each human cell has 46 total chromosomes, which is just 23 pairs. The DNA is usually kind of condensed together into a chromosome. Uh, so th that's all a chromosome is, is just DNA highly condensed down into uh, kind of a X-like shape. Um, and it gets wound around these histones, these little molecules to help condense it down. So then it's not just this big tangle of strands. Instead, they're condensed up, packaged up um, uh, in chromosomes. When the chromosomes are replicated, they stay attached to each other by the centromere. And when you have two chromosomes attached to each other by centromeres next to each other, they're called chromatids. That then allows cell mitosis to occur because you now have two perfect copies, hopefully, of each chromosome. Um, now you need to separate them into two separate cells, which then creates the process of cell mitosis. In order for cell mitosis to occur, you need to create a mitotic apparatus, which is where the centrioles come in, which are these two tubular structures, which um, these kind of strands, fibrotic-like strands, come off them to attach to the DNA and pull them apart, and then also pull the cell apart. So the mitotic apparatus is just this: these centrioles with these spider leg-like structures that help manipulate things within the cell. So first phase of mitosis, prophase. Prophase is the formation of spindle, which is the spider leg thing that I talked about. The chromosomes within the nucleus condense down even further, so then they can be packaged up and moved. And we're getting ready for the next phase, which is prometaphase. So first phase is just prophase. Now we're in prometaphase, which is now the growing of the spindle to attach to the chromatids at those centromeres, so right at the middle portion where the chromosomes are attached, and then they pull one chromatid of each pair toward the cellular pole. So the spindle are attaching to things and starting to move them around. We then have metaphase, which is now where the mitotic apparatus pushes further apart, and then we, we line up on the equatorial plate. And then we have anaphase. Anaphase is where the fun begin, where they start to get pulled apart, allowing telophase, which is where the cell membrane gets pushed in and kind of pinches two cells apart. So if we kind of go back to that original figure that was right at the beginning here, um, we have our cell, which starts to go through prophase, where we have our centriole creating that spindle, moving along the sides, um, and then now we're kind of getting set up. We then have prometaphase, where the spindle's attaching to the centromeres, and also our nuclear envelopes breaking up. We then have metaphase, where they're aligning on the equatorial plate, attached to our spindle and our centrioles. And then we have our fun part, the anaphase, where they get pulled apart, the chromosomes that is. And then telophase, where the cell membrane pinches down, and we get two cells, and then the spindle and the centrioles kind of dissolve down and become less relevant. Each time that uh, cell mitosis occurs, we actually don't read the very ends of the DNA strands, so they get slightly shorter every single time a cell is replicated. 
Um, so we have this kind of buffer period right at the end, this uh, region of DNA that if, I suppose effectively does nothing, uh, but is just there to shorten, so then you don't shorten all the way into the functional portion of the DNA. So telomeres are this kind of cap of the DNA, which allows it to shorten uh, with progressive uh, replications. It is also a region which is a lot of interest with kind of aging and trying to slow down aging because it seems like aging is associated with shortening of these telomeres and telomerase helps to add on to those telomeres and maybe reverses aging, uh, for instance, or at least that's a thought process. Cell differentiation, the segment here is talking about effectively what I talked about earlier, how each cell has the entire genetic code, but that cell will only read the genetic code to perform the function that it needs to perform. But it technically has the ability, if it could read all the parts of the DNA, to do the function of any other cell. And the real dramatic example of that is the fact that in this experiment, they took one cell from the intestinal mucosa of a frog and implanted it into the ovum of the frog. And that went on to create a completely new frog. So that one intestinal mucosa cell turned into an entire frog organism. Um, so it clearly contains all of the DNA needed to create all of the different cells within that one frog being. Now to finish off this chapter, we go into a few definitions. So apoptosis is programmed cell death. So that cell is no longer needing to be used, whether it got damaged or maybe the body just needs to break it down. Um, it is programmed cell death. So it is the triggering of certain proteolytic enzymes uh, called caspases to effectively shrink the cell down, condense it down and make it a tiny little package, which then macrophages, for instance, can come along, uh, engulf it and digest it and get rid of it. So it's programmed cell death. It's slightly different to necrosis, which is where there's acute, severe injury to that cell and it effectively bursts. So it also dies, uh, but the problem is that you release um, all of the uh, kind of contents of the cell into surrounding tissues and then that triggers inflammation. So the difference between apoptosis and necrosis is really the presence of inflammation and injury to nearby cells, which is seen with necrosis. Apoptosis is, is clearly preferred just because it's, it's so controlled. And then lastly, cancer. Cancer is effectively caused by a mutation which creates uncontrolled cellular growth. So that one cell now has the ability to continue to divide and create a massive cell um, or multiple cells form either a lump or spread around and then just start to suck up all of the nutrients of the body because all it wants to do is grow and divide, grow and divide. So it sucks up all the nutrients of the body and that's effectively how it is fatal is that you just go into a state of malnutrition um, effectively or organ dysfunction if it takes over an organ. There's certain mutations which have shown to be more oncogenic or at least increase the propensity to cause cancers. Uh, so these are called oncogenes. They increase the ability to form cancer. And then we also have tumor suppressor genes. So if tumor suppressor genes become dysfunctional, then you're more likely to get cancer as well. So mutation in those two regions, either to increase oncogenes or decrease tumor suppressor genes, effectively allow that cell to divide uncontrollably. Most of the mutated cells, as I talked about earlier, most mutations do nothing. Um, but if you do get a mutated cell that's able to divide more frequently, let's say, most of them actually just die. And if they don't die, they may actually just have a feedback control system which tapers its growth um, or uh, the immune system recognizes it and kills it. So it's not like you get one cell that can divide uncontrollably and now you have cancer. Uh, it, there's a certain sequence of kind of uh, events that need to occur in order for that mutated cell to be able to divide uncontrollably without being seen and destroyed or dying itself. Mutations can also just occur spontaneously. There doesn't have to be any rhyme or reason to it, uh, but there are factors that can increase your chances of a mutation. They are kind of listed here. So ionizing radiation, x-rays for instance, or just being out in the sun, increasing your chances of skin cancer, uh, chemical substances. So this is where carcinogens come in, uh, things that you ingest that may increase your chances of a cancer. Physical irritants, um, abrasion, etc., that can increase the chances of cancer. Uh, and then hereditary, so an inherited form of cancer, which obviously exists. So you just have the gene that increases the chance of you having a, having a, can having a cancer. And then some viruses, some viruses just go and attach to or take over your genetic code in a way and then increase your propensity for cancers. This last little segment here is just the characteristics of a cancer cell. So there's no respect to growth limits, uncontrolled cell division. They are less adhesive. They spread around the body or spread around locally. And then they produce angiogenic factors. This is just saying that they increase blood supply to themselves, effectively sucking away all the nutrients from the body. Um, and once again, causes a malnutrition state, 
or disrupt organ function. And that's how you end up passing away from, from a cancer. So that is the end of the chapter. I hope it was enjoyable. Once again, check out the website if you want to see uh, more material. Otherwise, feel free to just continue following along with these video recordings.